Good morning, church, and welcome to worship this day with the communities of Joyful Spirit United Methodist Church and Frazee United Methodist Church. Whether this is your first time, your 10th time, or your 100th time, whether you are a lifer in the communities of Wadena, Deer Creek, and Frazee, Minnesota, where we're located, or you're just cruising by on the internet highway, we welcome you. And we are glad that you are here with us to worship the living God in our midst this day. My name is Pastor Kevin Gregory, and this is my first time actually worshiping with you all as well. And I want to mention how excited and humbled I am to be serving in this role at this time in this place. I look forward to getting to know you all and discovering what it is that God is doing in our midst in this season of ministry. I'm recording this section here from my new place, and I look down and there are a lot of unpacked boxes and cleaning to do, which is how I will be spending my 4th of July weekend. So eventually, this space will look more worshipful as we continue to have services like this one in the future. But right now, I don't have a lot of furniture. So I ask for your grace and your forgiveness on this, my first attempt at hosting and presiding over an online service. I hope, though, that as we begin this time of worship, as you are taking a moment in your space, in your home, or outside on your porch, in your car, wherever it is that you are today to enter into a mindset of worship, may we humbly approach this time ready to meet God's spirit, ready to be still, and ready to open ourselves to what God is saying or doing this day. And I invite you, before we join together in these centering words, to take a deep breath, to breathe in through your nose and hold it. And then to slowly exhale. And I invite you to take another one, to breathe in God's spirit, and to be present in this place. And now may we join together in the centering words, which you'll find in the video. Almighty God, on the seventh day after you created everything in all of creation, from the grass to the sun and stars, to bugs and birds and the breeze, you rested. Help us this day to find rest in you so that we might be renewed and transformed to follow you more closely. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is brought to you by the lovely piano playing of Joyful Spirit pianist Kim Uselman. Thank you to Kim. It is Lord, I lift your name on high. And the words will pop up here on the video and you're invited to sing along with Kim's playing. In the future, as we continue these services, we'll work on ways to have folks from both congregations singing and playing together, as well as reading scripture and participating in other ways. But for now, may we continue in our worship singing, Lord, I lift your name on high.
We'll move now into a time of prayer as we lift up our prayer concerns, those we know and those we don't know. If there are joys and concerns that we are unaware of or that go unmentioned in this service, we hope that you'll leave a comment in a Facebook post for these services or email myself at Kevin B. Gregory one the number one, at gmail.com. Or for the Joyful Spirit folks, you can also email our lay leader, Kathy Techham. That info will also appear at the very end of this service on the last slide of the video. Therefore, let us continue this day in an attitude and spirit of prayer as we lift up those names of folks on our prayer list this day. From Joyful Spirit, we certainly want to lift up the Simmons family on the passing of Don Simmons, whose life we celebrated this last week. We also want to continue praying for Gary Hanuxala, Ellen Spear, and Norma Lee. And then from Frazee, we want to pray for and remember the Ryerson family on the passing of Barry and Judy's son, Jeff Jasperson. May then we go to God in prayer this day. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks this day for the gift that it is to gather in your presence to be in your midst, and to seek you this day. We give thanks for platforms like this, that although we may not can gather in person together in ways that we are used to, we can still meet you and one another this day. That, God, is an ongoing gift that we are humbled and graced to receive. May we not take this ability for granted as we go forward. God, we ask for healing and comfort this day for the Simmons and Ryerson families as they grieve loss in their midst. We ask for your guidance and comfort over them. Hold them. We ask also for prayers for Ellen and Gary and Norma, for those suffering injury or disease this day or recovering from surgeries. Be with those that we have named here in this space and those whose names live silently in our hearts or out of our periphery. God, too, this weekend, we have celebrated once again the birthday of this nation. We've remembered our values. We have lifted up those whose finished and continued service keeps us safe. We have perhaps watched fireworks or grilled or proceeded through a normal holiday weekend. But God, we know that this time is anything but normal. We sit with the weight of COVID on our shoulders alongside questions of employment statuses and questions of values and structures and systems as folks cry out for justice once again, once again for people of color in this country. We continue to pray for nurses and other workers taking risks in order to continue providing essential services and to provide for their families and for all those who have loved ones affected directly by the virus. God, there is much happening in this world of ours that makes us ask questions, seek new answers, and wonder if things were ever normal to begin with. On this day, oh God, may we be renewed and refreshed. May we, the weary, the anxious, the tired, the sick, the thirsty, the hungry, the scared, the needy, may we who carry heavy burdens come to you and your people to be transformed and redeemed so that we might do the work of your kingdom in a world that so desperately needs it. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray, who taught his disciples to pray in this way, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll move now into our scripture reading and message. I was able this week when I was in Wadena on Wednesday to record my message in the sanctuary of the First Congregational Church of Wadena, where Joyful Spirit is currently housed. So I invite you to join me there in their sanctuary now. Good morning, Joyful Spirit and Frazee United Methodist Churches. It is a privilege to be preaching this day in the sanctuary of the First Congregational United Church of Christ 
here in Wadena, where Joyful Spirit is currently housed. We have two readings this morning, the first from Paul's letter to the church at Rome from the seventh chapter, verses 15 through 25. I invite you to follow along at home. Paul writes, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law, that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. What wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this word. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the gospel according to Matthew, from the 11th chapter, verses 25 through 30. I invite you to hear these words. And at that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures have been read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what it is you say to us this day. Amen. I had high hopes back in March as the pandemic was beginning to onset when coronavirus, COVID-19, and social distancing were all new words in our vocabulary. I can imagine that many of you did too. By now though, over a hundred days into our new reality, and simultaneously, with mourning the death of over 120,000 citizens of this country, we have become seasoned pros with the vocabulary, with mask wearing, with meeting outside, with meeting in spaces virtually like this one. We are beginning to adjust to this global, new, and novel situation that we find ourselves in. But like I said, I had high hopes. And as many of you know, I just, and by just I mean like three weeks ago, completed my Master of Divinity degree at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Back in March, we were about to begin the final quarter of classes, which would eventually be entirely online if we were, after we received an extended week of spring break. And Kate, my partner, who I hope that you will all have a chance to meet during my year here serving as pastor of both Joyful Spirit and Frazee, Kate and I, before the bars and restaurants in Chicago, went, we went to close, we went to our favorite bar and restaurant, Jimmy's, which is in Hyde Park, in the Hyde Park neighborhood where the University of Chicago is. And we were sitting there, and I remember Kate saying, this might be the last time that we come here. 
To which I remember responding, surely we'll be able to come back in June before we graduate. But of course, I was wrong. There was a poem that made the rounds on Facebook as the pandemic was beginning, that at the time I took intense comfort in. I remember tearing up a little the first time I read it. The poem was called, And the People Stayed Home. And perhaps you saw it or saw pieces like it many months ago. It was written by a retired teacher named Kitty Amira from Madison, Wisconsin. And the poem goes like this. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, and some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. Now I read this and thought about all the things that I could get done in the short nine weeks that I still had left of school in Chicago. I thought about all of that time that I would finally have. I had also, right before the pandemic started, visited one of the libraries at the University of Chicago to check out a few books to read in all that spare time. And by a few, I mean I checked out eight. I was entirely over ambitious. One of the things that you will all learn about me is that I love books. I have entirely too many. They were a pain in the rear to move to Wilmer, but I loved them. And I would love to have a small library in whatever future home that I end up in. And of course, to forecast the end of this story, what's the point of a library if you've read every book in it? If there isn't still something that can delight or surprise you? I didn't finish any of the eight. I did manage to get part of the way through one of them, so I will give myself credit there. These were like thick, thick books too. I think I checked out like five history books, a theology text, and two novels. And I was still finishing class too, so it was abundantly ridiculous to think that I would have that kind of time or the ability to read much of anything, much less thick academic books in addition to the thick academic books that I was already having to read. I can't imagine that I was the only one that began this period with good intentions. Paul's words today, writing to the church at Rome, rang true. Amidst the word vomit of endless I statements, Paul begins, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. As this pandemic has got on, as we have watched the reality of this new normal sink in, as we have moved from crisis to crisis, as the laments of protests still continuing around this country cry out for justice for Black folks and other people of color too long overdue, the naive optimism of Amira's poem seems hidden in the background. We have met our shadows, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. I saw one author reword Amira's poem, keeping the same structure, and I won't read the whole thing, but the first, the first stanza goes like this. And the people went to work and fought fires and intubated patients and delivered packages and served food and earned a living and did their jobs day in and day out with no rest and were exhausted. And many of their friends and neighbors and family members died. And they grieved while enraged. Some drank more, some abused more, some hid, some expressed themselves too much, but were not heard. And the people were driven further into darkness. It is here, months and months down the road, amidst the anxiety and the fear and the skepticism and the pain and the loss, the rallying wail for things to return to normal, and the sheer exhaustion 
that has become planning, your mask wearing, and hand washing, etc. It is here that Jesus' words today, Come to me, all who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest, ring true and hit deeply for us. Jesus calls us to rest, rest, rest. Where this passage lies in Matthew's gospel, Jesus and the disciples have sort of settled in to a pattern as Jesus engages in the work of God's kingdom in the city of Capernaum, where he spent most of his three years of public ministry. Jesus has already gone onto the mount to deliver his now famous three-chapter sermon, and daily teaching and healing and miracles and parables have become the new normal for those disciples and the others who followed Jesus. You can picture many of the 12 thinking, this is how it's always going to be. We'll teach and we'll preach and we'll heal and things will be good. But we know the foundation of our faith rests on the fact that that assumption is wrong. It rests on the fact of the cross. Take my yoke upon and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. What Jesus is offering here is the kind of rest, the kind of relationship and opportunity that seems all too important in this moment. In the midst of everything, the kind of rest for our weary, weary souls that only God's grace can mend and heal. It's the kind of grace and rest that exists in relationship with God and with God's people, that exists when we allow ourselves to love and to be loved by God and to love and be loved by our neighbors. And although even at this moment, when we continue to socially distance, when a pastor's very first Sunday at a new appointment takes place online and through video, we know that God is still working in relationship working in our ongoing, change-filled, new normal. We know we need one another. Because when Jesus tells us to come to him, we are all gathered as the church, waiting to bless, to receive, and bless one another with that deeper rest. We know this next year will continue to be a challenge the virus, as we are continually told, it's not going anywhere. This is life now. But we also know our story, God's story, displayed in scripture, in tradition, and in history, is a story of ever-infinite change and new normals. When Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, God's grace supplied them with the ability to make a new life for themselves and their children. When God's people were held in bondage and slavery in Egypt, God, through Moses, said, let my people go. When Israel wanted kings to be like everyone else, God granted their request and anointed David, and then Solomon, and the temple was built. And then when Israel and Judah were conquered and became refugees and exiles, eventually God allowed their return. And in the fullness of time, God came into the world through Christ, and God lived and preached and died in this world and taught us how to live and to be. Our story as Methodists rests on God doing new things in the midst of the old. When in the 1700s, John Wesley, our founder's heart was strangely warmed and he declared, the world is my parish and a movement within the Anglican church was born. This weekend, we celebrated the 4th of July the birthday of this country, a new, new normal as colonists revolted against their mother country to start a new nation. With the promise and the declaration of independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as time has gone on, indeed, the dimension of that promise has changed. The promise of these truths expanded to mean not just white property-owning men, but women and people of color. A promise 
that we are still trying to live up to and live into today. Amidst change, God is at work. Amidst new normals, God is at work. What an amazing gift. And what an amazing gift to be in relationship with you all and with one another and with our God. May we continue to live into the ways in which we need and are bound to one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to end this time of worship, I invite you to receive this benediction. Following, you'll find ways to continue to contact and connect with us, as well as ways to continue to give your gifts and offerings in this season. Now receive this benediction. May you go forth this day to find rest in God, the kind of rest that then points you back outward to God's people and God's world in need of your gifts and good works. May we go forward from this space to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with you, oh God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.